Welcome to Self Hacked Radio, where cutting edge science meets cutting edge health. Hello, everybody. I am here with uh, Todd Becker, who is a biochemical engineer. He works in biotech in Silicon Valley. He's got a master's at Stanford, and he's got degrees in biochemistry, chemical engineering, and philosophy. He is a popular blogger at gettingstronger.org. Now, to get a basic background of you, what issues did you deal with, and what have your improvements been? Yeah, so I wouldn't say I had very severe issues in any area. It was more that there was a couple of uh, challenges that I dealt with, and I noticed some connections between them. And I would say the first one was that I used to wear glasses for myopia, right? So I, I was dependent on those glasses, and I found a way to essentially get rid of the glasses and improve my eyesight. And there were some general learnings and principles there. I also wanted to lose weight uh, several years ago, probably about 10 or 15 years ago for the first time. I went on a low carb diet and lost, you know, 10 or 15 pounds. And then later on, I found, you know, improved ways to do this through intermittent fasting and essentially dropped about, um, you know, 25 or 30 pounds from my, from, from the high point and did it pretty effortlessly. And then I, uh, I found that, uh, um, being a parent of teenagers was stressful. So I found, uh, some philosophical approaches um, to essentially becoming more resilient. And the common connection here uh, is, is a principle called hormesis, um, and it's a way to embrace stress and use it to your advantage rather than to avoid it. And I, you know, so I found that this concept was broadly applicable in many different areas, both as a philosophical approach, but also when you dig into it, if you look at underlying biochemical mechanisms immune mechanisms, uh, metabolic mechanisms, you find that, in fact, we've evolved to be able to handle stress and get better at handling stress um, by exposure. So I was kind of really interested in how that principle can be leveraged in so many different areas that at first seem to be unrelated. Right. That's fascinating that you were able to correct your myopia. I mean, what, were you, what number were you before and what number are you now? My I myopia was myopia. was pretty pretty mild. I was about uh, two diopters, mm -hmm. you know, so one and a half to two two diopters, but enough to need glasses for driving, that type of thing. Um, and what are you now? Now I I don't need glasses at all. Twenty twenty. Yeah, maybe even better than twenty twenty. Oh wow. Yeah, and you know, it, it, this I found has helped people who've had more severe myopia as high as. Six or, or seven or even higher significantly reduce or, or eliminate their myopia. So it's not just applicable to people with mild myopia. So okay, so I want to actually talk about that because that's um, obviously a ton of people have myopia, including me. Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, I'm I'm maybe like a four and a half or something to All five. Right. Yeah. So my I mean, I I looked at your protocol, I delved into it a little, I tried it a little. The only problem with it is for me is that. Um, since I'm like at five, it kind of, it's hard. You have to wear your glasses a lot of times. And so you're yeah. kind of reversing the benefits that you made. Another thing is when I wore those, um, you, you have to wear the, uh, the plus, plus lenses, the plus lenses. Right. So when I wore those, I just found I got a headache. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and, and yeah. like, as it is, like without my glasses alone, I have to, uh, I have to look pretty closely to the screen with those. I was like touching, <laughs> I was like touching the computer is like, mm. what's going on? And then I'd get a headache. But um, I'm assuming that you would do it more gradually, uh, maybe. Yeah, I think you probably did it. You probably did it wrong from what. From yeah, what yeah, I, I think I did. Yeah, so did it wrong. Uh, yeah. Please so do, please I do get, correct this, me. This is one of the topics I get the most uh, questions about, and and it's uh, people get really confused about it. I did a um, a talk at Ancestral Health Symposium where I tried to lay out the principles, but it's still not the easiest thing for people to, to understand. The basic idea, though, is you reverse the process of what you normally do when you go to the, to the uh, optometrist. When you go to the optometrist, what they're doing is they're giving you a corrective lens that doesn't really deal with the root issue. It doesn't uh, get rid of your myopia. It just 
is an immediate uh, palliative solution that allows you to see clearly right away. So it's instant gratification, right? Um, but it doesn't get to the root cause. And myopia really is caused by uh, elongation of the eye to the point where you can no longer easily focus the image on the retina because the eye is getting longer and longer and it's focusing the image in front of the retina. So by wearing plus lens, by wearing minus lenses, the normal corrective lenses, you're actually making the problem worse now because you're essentially providing a crutch. It's as if, uh, you know, instead of going to the gym to work out, you, uh, you had some kind of an assist, right, to make things lighter so your muscles would get weaker. And there's something called the uh, incremental retinal defocus theory of myopia, and there's a lot of evidence for it in animals. Um, and essentially what happens is when the image focuses a little either in front or in back of the retina, it stimulates differential growth of scleral tissue. And so the eye is, is trying to reshape to deal with that. So if you're always doing near work and you're always looking close up, your eye is going to try to adjust to accommodate that. And then if, you, if you're wearing minus lenses for distance, it's as if you're, you're looking close up all the time. You're just um, not forcing your eye to look in the distance. So by reversing that process and now making yourself focus incrementally further away, you're going to stimulate those neuromodulators. And it takes a long time. This is why people have to be patient on it. Eventually, the eye will reshape itself. How long now, did your, it, in your case, How long did it take you, by the way? About a year. Done. See a year, and that was two. Yeah. Um, so for me, it, would, it could take like two and a half years. You didn't have cases as many instances where you had to wear them, so it could take me even longer, maybe three years. Well, but it took you a long time to get into the myopia, so that you can't yeah. expect it to reverse overnight. But let's take your case where you're, you said uh, four, five, six. Probably a five. Yeah. Five. All right. So. Basically, you take a meter and divide it by that, and that's your, your focal distance. So you can see a fifth of a meter, mm. or see, you know, you, know you're, you're, you have to look like this to be right. able to read anything in focus. Um, so that's very uncomfortable to be. And in fact, you only need the plus lenses when you get to two or less, mm. because at two, you're reading about 19 or 20 inches away, which is about as far as I'm sitting from the computer right now. So I could read comfortably, and to improve beyond that, I need the plus lenses to actually make my vision worse. But your vision is already worse than that. So you don't need plus lenses. That would right. that actually is overkill. You just need to sit a certain distance from the computer, but still probably too close. So in a case where your myopia is that strong, what I would recommend is just using weaker lenses. And, you know, shaving half a diopter or a diopter off your prescription. So if you're at a five go with a four or four and a half and then your eyes are still going to have to do a little bit of work for distance and you might even go even weaker than that for for close work but the point is find a lens that allows you to read right at the edge of comfort mm -hmm. so that way you're not going to get these headaches that you're talking about right you're, you're, you're providing a very incremental stress and you're only doing it for several hours a day and then for distance you're obviously using, you know, for driving, you, you need the glasses, but shave half a diopter off of it. You'll still be able to see pretty well, but your eyes will be working harder. And then you find with time it gets easier. I don't think you have to be uh, going at this hours and hours a day and, and killing yourself. And in fact, one general principle of hormesis is you want a stress that's just, it's kind of the Goldilocks principle. It's just right, not too weak, that it doesn't have no effect not so strong that it's causing pain i think I, I i think that would work definitely and uh i i was i definitely was doing it wrong <laughs> i yeah. should not have been but i i actually do my my glasses are uh they are shaved off like a point i, I do think people should give it a try and i'm going to be yeah. working on it more that's for sure but I, I think it's just a little difficult because Again, if you if you if you're wearing glasses like that, then you, how long do you put those on uh, that you shave that you have glasses shaved off um, one? Because you could also be stressing your eye too much. Maybe um, it's maybe too much hormesis, so you have to like wear these and then wear other ones. I mean, uh, you know, normal ones, and then so how long do you wear the 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 lower lens ones or? Uh, well, I think no, it's pretty. It's, it's a lot simpler than that. For distance, you just wear the. Undercorrected lenses. 
Okay. It's simple. And pick a, a degree of undercorrection that isn't going to stress you out. You know, if, if one diopter is too much, pick half a diopter. There's some level at which you won't even notice the difference. Okay. Right. So that can't, so you pick now, a level. What about when you're reading? And then for reading, that's the other thing. Pick whatever it takes to be able to read so that if you push it back two inches, it's out of focus. Right. Now, if you're, uh, if you have mild myopia, you may actually need plus lenses to do that. If you have strong myopia, you don't need any lenses. Just read right at the boundary. And if it gets tiring, bring it in. You know, If that's uncomfortable, then pick, find a pair of lenses that gets it right. Now, this might seem complicated, but there's actually, you can go online and from adlens.com, there are these adjustable lenses that have the little dials on them. And you oh, can wow. easily dial it in so you're always reading right at that edge of comfort. And you don't even notice it. That's the great thing. There should be, you shouldn't even notice this, right? It's just like a subconscious thing, and suddenly your eyes are getting better. So, yeah, I'm definitely going to give that a try more. It's not the easiest thing in the world. I think that um, I didn't give it enough of a try. What about astigmatism? So if you have an astigmatism, they give you glasses for astigmatism. Do you think those are bad? You know, the astigmatism, as you work your way out of myopia, it tends to also reduce at the same time. But there are actually some, there's an, I'm not the only one who writes on natural vision reduction. There's a couple other people. And there's something, uh, uh, there's some techniques you can use to improve astigmatism where you look at um, these, these dials that have lines at different uh, angles. And if you have astigmatism, you'll tend to see one darker than the other. And there's some eye exercises you can do to try to work your, your way out of astigmatism. But generally, if you reduce your myopia, the astigmatism tends to weaken along with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I mean, I happen to uh, have gotten glasses that without the, that correction for, uh, for astigmatism, and I actually mm -hmm. like it better, so, yeah. um, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know why they gave me the other ones, I guess. Uh, do you think that, you think that's, uh, if, if I feel better without it, it's uh, probably good for me? I think that's fine. Yeah, sure. okay. Um, now, what, is, what other kinds of hormesis do you use besides uh, for improving your eyesight, and uh, what effects do you notice from them? For You're talking eyesight specifically? No, uh, other than eyesight. Oh, other than eyesight, other yeah. Than so eyesight. I'll give you a couple kind of major forms of uh, hormesis. One is uh, that I find extremely effective is intermittent fasting. Okay. I mean, it, you know, there's so many different things you can do, but there's like a couple big buttons you can push that will significantly improve your health. That's one of the most powerful ones, w without a question. And, and why is that? Um, people are afraid of fasting because they think that what's going to happen is it's going to lower their metabolic rate and they'll go into starvation mode and all of these things. And it's true that if you go three or four, you know, two, three, four days, um, you can start to get some tissue breakdown and muscle breakdown. But what we're talking about here is something between 12 and 24 hours kind of a fast. And if you, you can do it one of two ways, the typical way is something that was popularized in this Fast Five diet, which is not the current Fast Five diet, but it's Bert Herring's Fast Five diet. And his idea was eat within a, a five-hour window a day. And you can vary that based on your lifestyle. I tend to prefer, I like dinner, you know. So uh, on the days that I'll do intermittent fasting, I'll skip breakfast, skip lunch, and, you know, eat an early dinner and stretch that out a little. Maybe only eat within three hour window there. Or you can do it the other way. You can eat breakfast and skip dinner. The point is if you go at least 12, ideally at least 14, 16 hours at a stretch without eating, and that includes sleeping by the way, so it's very convenient to make the fast go through the nighttime one way or the other. If you do that, you start to lower your bit, your basal insulin level and you start to back off on, on mTOR activation and you, you start to uh, turn on autophagy which is a cellular intracellular cleaning process which has a lot of benefits in terms of removing damaged proteins your BDNF, your brain drive, neurotrophic factor starts to get a boost has a lot of health benefits for the brain um, and metabolically hormonally huge number of benefits. I mean, there's tons of research on this in animals and humans. You can also do alternate day fasting where you just don't eat for a day and then you eat 
to your heart's content the, the next day. I tend to find that not as, as convenient, but that's, it's a matter of personal preference. The point is if you do this intermittent fasting at least a couple times a week, you don't have to do it every day. You go through this process of cleaning house, shifting your metabolism, clearing out a lot of uh, um, metabolic byproducts that are detrimental. It's really good for um, just overall energy too. People are surprised about that. The one thing I would point out is that if you're used to eating the, this recommended pattern of you know six snacks throughout the day and always feeding the glucose and making sure your blood sugar is carefully you know in a tight range by eating a lot, then when you suddenly go to fasting, you may experience some hypoglycemia and a bit of a blood crash, and that's not advised. So I think, as in a lot of things hormetic. It's good to do things gradually. So train yourself gradually to go longer and longer. Start by just cutting out snacks. Eat solid three meals a day. Then see if you can get by uh, maybe eating breakfast a little bit later and eventually skipping it. You can also cheat a little bit by, for example, eating high-fat snacks or, or snacks that have very little protein or carbohydrate because um, – that will still allow your insulin level to go lower. It will train you to upregulate some of the lipases that you need to access your own fat stores. So you can cheat a little bit, maybe have a little coffee or tea, add a little coconut oil or, or butter in there if you want to. But eventually, um, you get to the point where you just have this constant, even energy, and you're not craving the food. And people don't believe it, but it takes probably a couple of weeks if you stick at this and you can adapt to it. And in fact, it makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. You know, we didn't evolve in an environment where we could always count on six snacks a day. Humans, other animals have fat stores and they're able to go, um, you know, without eating for a few days, without dying. So it's, 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 uh, I find that very beneficial. So that's one one primary. Cool. Uh, yeah, can we just talk about that a little more? I just want to. Okay. Um, so I I actually think intermittent fasting is is great, um, but happens to be uh, I deal with people who um, who have a certain set of issues. A lot of the people. So if you're like overweight and you've got just standard American diseases, you, no serious health issues, then. Uh, we're completely on board. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm completely on board with you there. And you, sure. you've even said that you know you gotta you gotta do it to the level that you can. But I, I just want people to um, be a little careful, and and maybe you can comment as well. Uh, so a lot of people I deal with actually are too thin, mm, okay. and they have lower insulin. So uh, you know, and they also get hypoglycemic. So their cortisol system is not functioning right in order to respond to the hypoglycemia. And so hypoglycemia is terrible. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and we both agree there. But, and there's other issues with that as well. But um, I definitely do agree that, that you know, if you're, if you're robust, robust enough at this stage and you can tolerate it, then mm -hmm. you want to keep maybe pushing the envelope, especially if you want those metabolic benefits like lower insulin. But again, if you already have very low insulin, my insulin is lower than two, or it was. I checked it twice. So it's mine is two. Yeah, yours is two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so it's fine. Uh, it used to be, mine used was to be very two high. Or, under, or under two. It w I think it was lower than two. So yeah. um, what we see is uh, that was without any fasting. Um, so there are obviously big changes in biology, uh, my biology, your biology. I think it's good to uh, kind of say, oh, it, does that mean? Um, so at some point, when when my health issues were much worse, I needed to eat every few hours or else I would get hypoglycemic mm. and if I just wouldn't eat and I would kind of do intermittent fasting, I think it was just too much for my system at that time. And mm -hmm. so I think it depends on your, the state of your health. That's number one. And if you are feeling you're getting hypoglycemic too often, it means you're doing it too much. It's, right. it's not hormesis. You're going overboard. Um, but again, th th usually there's, you know, if you're healthy enough, and um, you just have like maybe gaining weight and your insulin is high, I would re definitely, I'm on board that you want to do more intermittent fasting. Uh, another problem with, um, with that is the circadian rhythm. <laughs> and okay. uh, we, did, we did speak about it slightly before the interview. <laughs> so uh, we do have some disagreements there, but um, I'm very into uh, 
like okay so number one i'm very into like eating within a 12 hour period I, for me if i go some if i go 14 hours or 16 hours it's too much for me but 12 hours is perfect for me and mm -hmm. um but what happens is let's say if if you know if i don't eat enough calories in the daytime and again i don't have issues with becoming fat or anything like that so if i don't have uh enough calories in the daytime I'll get hypoglycemic at night. So if my last meal is at 5 and I'm waking up at 8, it's just too long mm. for me. I'm going to get hypoglycemic at night. It's going to trigger a stress response before I go to sleep, something like that, and then my and then I'm going to just feel wired. So and then you and I don't want to eat before I go to sleep. So right. I think um uh it, you have to look at what state you're in regard yeah. and what your no, you, biology is. Why do you think you don't have the ability to turn on gluconeogenesis or to access your fat stores for energy? I'll explain. I'll <laughs> so I, I actually have a, a whole bunch of posts coming. Uh, why? Uh, and I already released one of them. So uh, what are the big four hormones? Why somebody's fat or what makes you fat or thin? Why yeah. do some people have, you know, are, are, can't gain weight, which is a minority of the population? And why yeah. is most of the population, they can't lose weight? Um, so I do have a lot of ex explanations okay. there why somebody would be thin and and so uh, one one problem is that uh, let's say if somebody's mitochondria are not functioning right they're not producing enough ATP if you're not producing enough ATP you won't produce enough insulin and so uh, and when you have chronically low levels of insulin that causes changes in the hypothalamus to, mm. uh, and this is theoretical but it, it is based on science but like you know animal studies or whatnot or you know, sure uh, but uh, Chronically low insulin will cause your hype. It causes changes in the hypothalamus where, um, you know, you're for whatever reason. If this is not the reason, then there's some other reason where people with these set of issues, their hypothalamus is only going to uh, activate a stress response to counteract the low glucose only when it's lower. So the, the threshold mm -hmm. becomes lower. So instead of activating a stress response and a normal stress response. Uh, when your glucose is at 80, let's say, it's going to go to 60, but the problem is you're going to get hypoglycemic. And mm. when you get hypoglycemic, it causes an excess of glutamate, and it, that breaks down your mitochondria. So, um, and I notice this. Like, I know what glutamate feels like. It's, I, I'll, I'll like, feel like really weak, and then I'll get like this burst of energy, sure. excess glutamate, but then I'm going to feel like tired and it's like, it just feels like I, it's, uh, if I like look at the trends, I feel like, no, I'm not doing better right now in the past couple of weeks if mm. I'm getting too hypoglycemic. And so, um, I think it's good to, you know, to do these things, but it, it has to be done in, in a careful way. And I think you agree that, you know, if, if you're not feeling well, then you went overboard. Um, of course. Yeah. yeah. So in the beginning, yeah. uh, in the beginning, I needed to eat every two hours. Uh, now again, I'm completely fine when I'm just 12 hours. No issue. I I actually feel better. So um, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess it, it, two two comments there. One is it does sound like you're still able to go for 10 or 12 hours without eating. So you're accessing some of the benefits of autophagy there. Right? Yeah. So you you are getting some benefits there, and you don't have to do it every day. If you're if you do that a few times a week, you're getting those benefits. So that's one thing. The other thing I would say though is my battery is going to be dead, sorry. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I'm just okay. going to plug it in. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing you would say? Yeah, just looking at it from kind of an engineer's standpoint, what you're describing sounds to me like a control system that's not well balanced, right? Because we have, and you mentioned the hypothalamus, which is regulating all of these functions and making sure that we uh, don't get uh, out of balance. And, and, of course, there's insulin receptors there that are very sensitive, and we have these sort of two... The, the appetite center carefully controls and you know regulates energy and, and appetite. Um, the fact that you're going so long before it, it, your hypothalamus kicks in suggests to me that there's something wrong with the control system. I, and I, I don't agree. know what, but the, I don't know what the underlying issue is. Whether it's an inflammation, you know. I I, I think that's what it is. When yeah. whenever I eat, uh, so what what triggers is it is like eating foods that I'm sensitive to. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, lo I think it's localized, but it could be systemic inflammation, localized inflammation in the hypothalamus. Uh, the orexin system is definitely not working well. That's the wakefulness neurotransmitter. 
And, right. And, and, yeah. and, and, and the circadian rhythm is also uh, my circadian rhythm and the people I deal with, it's also not working well. So it's supposed to be in a certain time, certain metabolic processes are supposed to work better. But in my case, it was kind of like in the morning, my body thought the metabolic processes should be while I'm sleeping, the, the, those metabolic processes. And so, um, and it could also be from oxidative stress. It could be from uh, whatever it is. But um, the point is, there's definitely changes where people, the people I deal with, are getting hypoglycemic way more often. Sure. Um, and it's way worse. And they're having hypothalamic issues. So that central processor, which is regulating a whole bunch of systems, is not working well. And um, but I, that's why I'm saying I. I just wanted to, I agree that if you're overweight and you don't have these issues, which is most of the population, then you, you want to be following your approach. But it just happens to be that for my blog readers, I don't want them to get the uh, wrong idea. I want them to at least say, like, let me do what feels right. And, exactly, yeah. yeah. And I think it's good what you're saying, but they have to do it in, in a way that you advocate. Meaning, if you do too much and you're feeling not good from it, it means that... Uh, number one is you, that you did too much, but also that there is an underlying problem that you want to fix, though, before you start getting more. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. So if your if your uh, uh, if your control system is out of balance, there's other issues there, and it's probably something relating to inflammation, oxidative stress. It could be other dietary things. But yeah, get, yeah. Back in my to case, it about, was uh, like let's say gluten and plant lectins, and yeah. and a lot of the issues I dealt with, I started becoming sensitive to a whole bunch of foods, and they, they caused like and grains and things like that. They caused inflammation, and if I eat like gluten, which I experimented with in the past week, whatever, again I started noticing those hypothalamic issues uh, on a lower level because I only did it for a short time. But yeah, it's not able to. Um, would more likely get hypoglycemic, whereas um, if I if my diet is tight for a long time, um, and I'm staying away from foods I'm allergic to, then uh, my hypothalamus is working much better um, and it's able yeah. to yeah. So I want to pick up on a point you made about not overdoing it. This is a really really important point. the The, the byline of my blog is train yourself to thrive on stress, but it. The message is not to go overboard and, and you know subject yourself to just ridiculous amounts of stress, whatever that stress might be, dietary stress, vision stress, you know, physical exercise stress. There's a lot of athletes who way overdo it. And the question comes often, how do I know how much stress is the right amount in any given area? And this gets to another topic that I've written about and I know you're interested in, which is HRV, right? Which is heart rate variability. So it's, it's hard to know because we're so individual. Everyone has a unique condition. What one person can tolerate, another person may not. At different points in your life, you can tolerate more stress. An athlete can you know, run a certain distance one year and then that same workout would uh, be detrimental another year. So how do you know when you've trained enough and how do you know when you've overtrained? And HRV is a great tool for that because, um, as you know, heart rate variability, which is not heart rate, but it's the degree to which your normal heart rate varies. So instead of it being once per second, right, which would be no variability, it might be 1.05, 0 0.95, 1.15 seconds, 0.85, and the more variation there is in the heartbeat, the higher the heart rate variability. Well, you might think that's a bad thing, right, because we talk about arrhythmias and whatever. But it turns out that all of the rhythms in our body, all of the biorhythms, not just the heart, but, but the brain and even your gait, even something simple as the, how regular your step is, reflects something about your physiology. And it turns out that there's this balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems, right, the flight or fight uh, system, which is the sympathetic and the rest and digest system. And if you're too wired and too high strung and too over, uh, you know, some of the things you were talking about, about waking up at the wrong point in the night, your sympathetic system may be in overdrive. Similarly, if you overtrain, you may have too, too much of a sympathetic response. 
And what you'll notice then is that your heart rate variability starts to go down and become more regular, which is not a good thing. Um, uh, on the other hand, when you're relaxed and when you're uh, fit and, in, in, and well rested, your parasympathetic system is in control and you get more HRV. So the way athletes use it is, you, and you can buy apps for your, uh, your smartphone or you can buy watches that measure all of this. Athletes find that if, if they track their HRV and it's at a good level or increasing, they're fine. When they start to overtrain, they'll see a sudden dip in HRV. And they'll see that even before they subjectively notice something. And trainers have found this is great. It means lay off the training for a few days, get a little bit more rest. And the same thing can apply to stresses in life. If you're uh, working a bit too hard, not getting enough sleep, and you see the HRV go down, hey, you need to, t to back off a little bit. On the other hand, if you're not, if you're just doing nothing and your sympathetic system is underactive, um, you can also see imbalances. And there's different, different measures of this. So I found this is a great way to kind of do some experiments and see what works for you and what doesn't. And I learned a couple of really interesting things that were unexpected and they weren't really out there in the literature about things that benefited my HRV and things that hurt. So I'll start with one of the things that hurt it. And this was a surprise to me. Alcohol. Okay. All right. So I found that if I took, you know, like one drink, small drink, there was really not much of an effect. But if I even went to two drinks, or especially if I went to three, my HRV would just crater. It I, really went down. I wonder if that's because, um, and I actually wanted to ask you this question before. Um, the main, so the main determinant of the HRV, based on your explanation, is going to be how much your sympathetic system is activated, right? Is there mm -hmm. any other basic determinism of the HRV? It's the, it's really the balance between those two. Okay, it's the balance, but yeah. those are that's the main determinant: the sympathetic versus the parasympathetic, and that's going to be your HRV. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a bit oversimplified. There, if you get into the literature on this, there's multiple different measures where you can analyze things in frequency domain and time domain, and there's all these different analytics, but the simplest one is, is what you said. Okay, fine. And, and especially um, uh, for a given person's, the rest of a given person's biology. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, the changes definitely will indicate that. So yeah, alcohol is something that will activate your sympathetic nervous system yeah, very yeah. potently. So yeah, and it, it's kind of surprising because you think, oh, alcohol is making me more relaxed, right? And it's because you think, oh, parasympathetic system, relaxation, alcohol, good. But it's, it's not really, it's oversimplified to say it's about relaxation. It's really about... Um, I think it's just increasing GABA, but it's increasing your yeah. stress response. So it's not really... What is, I mean, so what is the parasympathetic system? Is that the vagus nerve? What else is involved in the parasympathetic system? Well, the vagus nerve is one of the transmitters of that. It's, it's right. What? Of, what? Yeah. yeah. Can you explain, uh, like, a more detailed? Uh, we, we, the, the sympathetic system, in my mind, is the hypothalamus producing the stress response and cortisol. You know, CRH, cortisol. Yeah. Um, uh, the parasympathetic would be something like the vagus nerve uh, transmitting signals, and uh, you know, gets some of those signals probably from the brain, goes to the vagus nerve, to a whole bunch of other organs. Is that what the parasympathetic system is? <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, it's a. It's not one thing. It, it's 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 a whole network throughout your entire body, through your gut, your brain. You know, the the connection between that. It's a distributed system, and yeah, the the hypothalamus does play a role. But what is telling the heart to to beat at different uh, frequencies? Or yeah, different it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the balance between those two systems. Yeah, but what is it? The vagus nerve connects to the heart. Is that what the is? It, is it something happening in the vagus nerve that that tells yeah. the heart? Okay. The vagus nerve does does have a big impact on on heart rate. Yeah. Okay, so is there? But I'm I'm trying to get a, a picture of what this parasympathetic is. Um, instead of just rest and digest, the the basic biology of it. This way, I can know. Um, I could you know I could better guess. Okay, well this thing. Uh, increases the stress response is not going to be good for the HRV, but if it increases the vagal nerve uh, or the vagal tone, then it would be good for HRV. So I think that's uh, coming from it from a more first principles way, in, and, and uh, it would allow me to do experiments better. Yeah, so you're, 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 uh, you're going beyond my, what's in my uh, 
downloaded in my immediate memory here. I'd have to go back and refresh myself on on some of the specific, you know, hormonal cascades and it's beyond mine too. Don't worry. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, but but um, you know, I we can talk about that later. I can maybe find some references on that. There's I a lot. That, of good, yeah, I think so. For now, chunks. I think the main thing that I I know is the vagal nerve, which connects to the heart, and uh, you know, the, there's different things that influence that tone. Mm -hmm. um, and the vagal nerve actually works with acetylcholine uh, most potently. So it's probably something like that going on. Um, yeah. But, Sometimes yeah. the term vagal tone tone is used. So yeah talk about the health of the vagal nerve and that right. does relate to parasympathetic response and that's actually also a little um a little fuzzy like vagal tone i think it uh, is what is exactly vagal tone i think it's um how much it activates or or how it activates so i think activating the vagal nerve it will increase vagal tone um do you know about that um, i don't I okay can't. fine yeah i would like to look into that issue a little more but to my knowledge they talk about vagal tone i think it just means vagal activation mm -hmm. um and I think there's other factors also, like um, you know how sensitive the vagal nerve is as well. So if you take in capsaicin, which is from cayenne and chili, it'll actually make it'll desensitize it in various ways. So um, in in a certain way, uh, yeah. So um, okay, <laughs> moving right. on though. Uh, so yeah. and actually, so, so it's, okay. it's good. It's good. And you know, like like yourself, I always like to delve into the mechanisms. Um, yeah. um, but I have to admit, I'm not fresh on exactly the question you asked about the vagal, the, the, the vagus nerve. Now, I do want to mention one thing that really made my HRV consistently go up and quickly. Okay. And I'm talking about within five minutes, I could get a boost of 10 or 15 points, which is huge okay. and consistent. And I could even reverse the alcohol effect with this. Okay. Cold showers. Nice. By the way, um, something clicked in my brain. So just, uh, the reason why it's important to know uh, exactly what influences yeah. the parasympathetic, cold showers increases thyroid-releasing hormone. Thyroid-releasing mm -hmm. hormone does, stimulates the vagus nerve, that will increase your HRV. So even though it'll, it might increase your stress response slightly in, it for you know just maybe in the beginning or something, but it increases the parasympathetic nervous system at the same time. Yeah. Now, what's really interesting is this again went against my intuition because when you get into a cold shower you do experience a real height it I love it by the way but when when you start to do this for people who haven't done it they almost fear it because it, it can be uh, uh, quite shocking and your heart starts beating rapidly and you, you you're breathing faster and you find yourself even gasping a little bit until you adapt to it right so you think oh my gosh this is really the sympathetic system. And it probably is briefly, but you're turning on thermogenesis, you're turning on the, what you talked about with acetylcholine, um, you're activating a lot of responses, but essentially then what your body's doing is, you know, we have, we're always governed by homeostasis, right? So whatever uh, uh, stimulus we're exposed to, the body's trying to uh, take that stimulus and bring us back to the middle again. So I think what happens is the thermogenesis and a lot of these parasympathetic responses are trying to calm you down in the face of being exposed to the cold. And th that benefit, what's really cool about it, lasts hours after you get out of the cold shower. So you get this brief, intense experience, which, by the way, the more you do it and the more you adapt to it, the, the greater it is. That, that sort of fear or kind of anxiety gets less and less after you do it for a week or two. And this beneficial afterglow effect that really lasts for hours uh, continues on. One of the psychological benefits I got from cold showers is it, it completely dampened the kind of anxiety or fear or um, anger response to uh, adverse events. So when you take the cold showers, then, you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic or somebody yells at you at work, it's like, whatever. It, it, and it has kind of an antidepressant effect. I don't fully understand mechanistically what's going on there. I, but, would, I would take yeah. a stab at that. So yeah. obviously, okay. it's working, obviously it's working through the vagus nerve and, and the parasympathetic, so you're obviously more relaxed. That's mm -hmm. the biggest thing. Um, but I would also say TRH is actually an antidepressant uh, hormone. Okay. Um, 
And so when you release that, it's stimulating the vagus nerve, but it's also an antidepressant hormone. Uh, that could be, um, and I've taken TRH by itself. It's actually very expensive. Um, All right. You're probably getting a bigger effect when you take it when it's released naturally. Naturally, um, yeah. Yeah, but I, I do notice like some of the same uh, effects and um, yeah, kind I of some of that. Kind of calming effect and yeah, 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 of course, yeah. anti-stress effect. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think, uh, but again, it's hard for you to absorb the TRH. So you have to put it sublingually. I don't know how much is being absorbed, but I do notice that it does have a calming effect and mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think uh, the cold showers are probably also producing endorphins. It feels like that too. Yes. Or something. Yeah. The, the, have you read research to that, or am I just making that up? No, it, there is an endorphin effect. There, there's some interesting psychological research on this, and and one of the, the seminal oh. papers is is by Richard Solomon, the uh, opponent of process theory of emotion. I don't know if you looked into that, but he he stu he studied two interesting things. Why is it that skydivers, when they jump out of a plane, the first time they're terrified, but the more they do it, that fear effect goes away. And why is it at the same time that they have this euphoric effect that lasts long, the whole day, from that brief one jump? And why does that effect get more pronounced with time? So he was explaining it in terms of, um, again, it's a homeostatic effect of turning on certain inhibitory processes. So you have this fear, and psychologically there's processes that go on that want to inhibit that effect so that you're not exposed to that. The other thing he looked at was addiction. You know, he looked at drug addicts and alcoholism, and there it was the opposite where you get this immediate gratification, this high, um, but then there's this tolerance effect where addicts, you know, the more they take the drug, the more they need to get that same high. And likewise, um, they get increasingly anxious and depressed in the interludes between their fixes. And again, he saw this as kind of the opposite of, uh, effect. So I think you can, you can look at hormones, you can look at neurotransmitters in, in either the, 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 uh, the thrill type of activity, which is the skydiving or the cold showers or uh, intense exercise where you have an, a period of discomfort followed by um, increasingly enhanced uh, feeling of euphoria or happiness that gets longer and longer the more you do it. Or the reverse, which is the addiction, where you get the brief pleasure followed by increasing uh, you know, withdrawal or negative effects. Um, right. And the, the, the chemistry or the biochemistry is different in each case, but I think it's, it's an interesting, almost general psychological principle. Interesting. I was thinking while you were talking, I was listening definitely. <laughs> I was thinking of other things that uh, the, the cold showers might benefit. So mm -hmm. I, it actually definitely is increasing endorphins because anytime you increase the stress response and you release ACTH, that leads to endorphins. Yeah. Um, so that's number one. Uh, but it's also releasing this, the CRH is actually like a, that, that hormone will uh, you know, make you feel awake. Uh, mm -hmm. Cortisol can also be um, is going to make you feel awake and in some ways more relaxed too. Uh, believe it or not, um, I've tried. Uh, to, I've taken hydrocortisone. <laughs> so well, yeah. you know, people people are they trash cortisol and they're fearful of it, but it actually it's a useful hormone in its natural cycle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You want to have that high cortisol in the morning and then you want it to go down and exactly. exactly. The problem is when it's always sustained at a high level. That's when you get into the chronic issues, exactly. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and also uh, noradrenaline. So um, yeah. there's drugs that increase noradrenaline and therefore depression. So the S, um, you know, SNRIs or you know, norepinephrine, uh, 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 a reuptake inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that's, you know, the, the stress response is increasing norepinephrine. And here's a Jack Cruz one. <laughs> uh, he says, like, the cold make your mitochondria work better. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, it can improve your mitochondria. And mm -hmm. also, I think that the T3, um, it's stimulating T3 and T3 uptake. I think that stuff can also, uh, I think it does have, like, when I stimulate my thyroid, <laughs> you're like, this guy's crazy. <laughs> but um, I do notice, like, a slight, uh, like, a bit of a boost beyond the, you know, um, Mm -hmm. uh, so it, I think it's the whole thyroid cascade and uh, the parasympathetic system and uh, the stress response. That's also why you, you know, why you, you in some ways you feel feel uh, happier 
with alcohol. It's increasing that stress response. Mm-hmm. So I think um, I th- that's uh, yeah. I, I wonder. There's probably a whole bunch of other ways that cold is helping, but um, that's what I've got. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah. So what else do you got? Uh, cold alcohol. Uh, oh, in terms of HRV. Yeah, in terms of HRV. Uh, I think the other thing what is when I do intermittent fasting, or and also when I tend to go low carb ketogenic, that boosts my HRV. Um, just yeah. low carb or ketogenic? Uh, that that continuum, you know, between low. I think. Do they, this, I'm, what I'm asking is like, does ketogenesis increase it even more? Yeah. So um, that's a good question. I don't know that I've looked at that correlation, but, but I, what I have observed specifically is that when I do intermittent fasting um, or when I cut carbohydrates out for more than 12 hours, right? I see a, I see a bump. Now, really to get into a, a ketogenic state, sometimes that can take days to really um, become ketogenic. So I haven't really drawn that correlation, but I wouldn't be surprised. I wonder what mechanism that's for. I, like, I haven't done research on what low-carb diets does to the parasympathetic system. Um, I'm curious how that's working. Uh, what about, um, okay, so there's a low-carb diet. Uh, what else? Anything? Uh, so exercise is an interesting one. If I exercise moderately, uh, I can keep my HRV up. But it, uh, if I exercise intensely, like a really hard workout, it plummets. But then the next day or two, it comes back higher than where it, where it was. So I think there's certain effects that are immediate, like the cold showers or alcohol. There's some effects where you're actually willing to take a momentary drop in HRV. Um, it's stressing your system, but the adaptive outcome of that is to put you at a higher place. Mm-hmm. So it, it's not always a straightforward thing. I think you have to track it for over a period of time and see what works. And I think the other comment is, at least from what I've read, what works for some people to boost their HRP doesn't work for others. It tends to be a very individual response. But I like that fact. I like the fact that it's telling you something about your unique physiology. What about, I bet, I'm willing to bet that breathing exercises will have a very big effect because various uh, types of breathing and yes. uh, different exercise could stimulate the vagus nerve. So I'm Yo- yoga and meditation have been shown to have to increase depth. HRV. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense then. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, the reason I'm talking I, I'm talking about HRV so much just for the listeners is because there's actually a ton of studies showing that HRV is correlated with a bunch of positive like uh, healthy states and. Higher HRV is associated with a whole bunch of healthy states, and lower HRV is associated with a whole bunch of disease states. Yes. So, um, yeah. So, getting it up, it's hard to, you know, figure out uh, causation sometimes, but it's very important in your system. It is, and and to to follow on your point, there is a number of clinicians who use it actually as kind of a leading indicator. Uh, it's been shown to be a leading indicator uh, for infections, cancer. And the, the drop in HRV shows up before certain other clinical symptoms. So I think that's pretty cool. What about the M wave? That's uh, you know, is, is that something that you think would be good for HRV training or? I don't really know about. M-wave. Oh, you, okay, fine. That's um, okay, yeah. fine. And w- so, what device do you use to measure your HRV? Because this is something I I'm not measuring, and I want to start measuring. Oh, okay. Um, so I have an app. I, I, I wear a heart rate. There's a heart heart rate monitor. That yeah, I what's use. that called? Um, the reason I didn't, uh, do the HRV is because none of them got good ratings on Amazon, <laughs> um, and I'm like, hmm, what's wrong with this? You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, are you very happy with yours? Yeah. So uh, you know, I, I, to tell you the truth, I used it a lot experimentally to sort okay. of find out what works, but I don't find a need to. To do oh, it. I see. I'm not okay. obsessive about. I'll, I'll just try to find a good one. Yeah, That's something I definitely want to um, start measuring. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, back to hormesis. Um, so, let's see. Um, okay, uh, how do you how do you use uh, how would you use hormesis to conquer fear? Ah, that's a good one. So. Uh, 
fear is a stress, right? Uh, psychologically, the concept of, of applying hormesis or, or what I call hormetism, which is taking hormesis, which is really just a biological phenomenon, right, and using it. So I, that's what I call hormetism. Uh, it involves finding a stress and exposing yourself to that stress so you become more resilient to it. Um, the classic example physically is lifting weights, right? So when you lift weights, you're actually damaging your muscle fibers. The microfibers then, when they heal, they come back stronger. Or in an immune response, uh, you're exposing yourself to some kind of an antigen and you're developing uh, you know, ability to tolerate that more. The same thing is true, you can say, psychologically. You know, exposing yourselves to stresses in the right amount can actually build resilience to it. So in the case of anxiety or fear, there's a well-known uh, series of, of um, therapies known as exposure therapy. Right? So you expose yourself to actually the object of fear in um, increasing doses. It's been used particularly effectively for fears like fear of snakes or fear of certain objects where a person is at first terrified and is done in stages so the person might first look at pictures of snakes and expose themselves to it or actually physically see one and eventually get to the point of touching and handling it and as terrifying as that may sound it actually is an amazingly fast way to decondition yourself to certain fears. Um, public speaking is another fear that is conquered by exposure, just basically by doing it. Another one that where there's some research showing it's particularly effective is agoraphobia. These people who are fe fearful of going outside of their house or a certain distance or in into public spaces, the therapist accompanies them and they get better and better at it. And, um, you know, as opposed to avoiding the object of fear, you're actually desensitizing yourself to it. It works. Have you overcome any of your fears, or um, are you afraid of anything now? Like, what are your what are your pet like? What what are you afraid of now, if anything? I don't really have any fears, but I'll, I will give you one example where I experienced this directly, and that is um, one of my favorite activities is rock climbing. Okay. And when I first did even fairly simple climbs, I was terrified of heights. Mm, okay. Acrophobia, and 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 even when I started, uh, you know, in the gym, and I got good at that. When I did some of my first outdoor climbs, like in Yosemite, got up to some pretty high heights, and um, you know, I was truly afraid. But the more I've done it, I almost completely deconditioned myself. So you know, I've got to be careful that I'm uh, clipped in and I'm following all the right procedures because I could be a little bit flip and make a serious, you know, mistake there if I'm not careful. But yeah, fear of heights is something you can definitely decondition yourself. That's interesting. I've used uh, I've used hormesis in some ways to uh, overcome my fears, uh, mm -hmm. and I've used it over a long period of time without actually trying to use it. But the bottom line is, I think um, if you know if you just expose yourself to it, your body you, you'll stop becoming afraid. It's, it's yeah. as simple as that. And for me, um, I mean, I would just like do things even though I was afraid, and then eventually you just stop becoming afraid. Uh, and one of the like weird but believe it or not like um one of the things i used to be afraid of i mean most guys or most people are you know approaching random people and, and yeah especially uh you know approaching women if you're a guy yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's like the most dreaded thing for for guys <laughs> right um just, and, and even and this, yeah I mean, and even just, like just do it right huh just, exactly just do it um <laughs> even like uh I, I heard tim ferris speak about it he said on his show i heard him on a podcast he was saying like out of everything he was doing, that was the most dreaded thing that he that 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 he was afraid of. And um, also, Larry David mentioned it on on a podcast with uh, on sixty minutes. He's just there. He's like uh, uh, Rose asked him, um, you know, are you afraid of anything? He's like, yeah. He's like, I'm terrified of approaching women. <laughs> so um, yeah. no, so it's just an extremely uh, common fear amongst men. And I just I was like, I, I don't yeah. do it anymore really, but. Um, at a certain point, I was just like approaching like a bunch of random women, and you and I, and you get over the fear, and um, and a lot of that transfers too. So, you know, just doing things like public speaking or whatever it is, even though you're afraid, I found that I just was able to get over any fear. Yeah. Um, anything you do, you could be afraid of. You're you know you're you're a lot of times you're just afraid to fail. That's mostly what it is. I think really a fear comes down to the ego. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Like if you have a really strong or positive view of, you know, your whole being like, well, I, you know, and, and you fail it. You're afraid of failure. So and who does that hurt? Really? It hurts your sense of self. So I think um, I think it kind of like, you know, you, when you expose yourself, it kind of brings your ego down and you become more resilient to any kind of uh, fear. And now I'm not really I'm generally not really afraid of anything. Uh, whether sure. it's uh, starting a new venture or doing something new. I mean, people are just so... I think this the society is just so terrified at failing at everything and anything. You know, whether it's... Yeah. Well, one of the key fears, and you mentioned it, is rejection. Rejection. And, and, and you've probably heard of this. Uh, several people have come up with this independently. Rejection therapy. Okay. And the idea is every day you you have to be rejected at least once. And so you have, whether it's asking a girl out or asking some ridiculous thing of a random stranger. So, um, and you just have to find something that will actually, somebody will say no to. And then that sort of immunizes yourself against this. And, I and, do that uh, all the time. I'm like, yeah. I'm like <laughs> outrageous. I'm like say, asking things, doing things that are completely <laughs> outrageous. <Yeah. laughs> Even on my interviews, I'm like, uh, you know, sometimes I, I like ask tough questions. And, um, and, you know, people could get scared sometimes. But if you just do it enough, mm -hmm. that it, it goes away. Yeah. If, if you take this one step forward, you can almost turn this into a philosophy. And uh, to me, one of the really appealing philosophies in this regard is Stoicism. And if you've read about this, but there were both Greek and Roman Stoics. Um, and the, the basic idea here is, and, and people misunderstand what Stoicism is. They think it's, it's about being emotionless and not responding to anything and having kind of this dour view of life and not having any fun. When in reality, it's the opposite. It's actually a way to inject joy and happiness into your life. There's a really good book by uh, William Irvine called um, uh, A Guide to the Good Life, The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy. And he takes uh, a lot of the famous Greek and Roman, Roman Stoics, you know, uh, Epictetus and um, Marcus Aurelius, and translates some of their dialogues and learnings to the modern world, right? And gives some really good practical examples of how you can use uh, sort of a contemplation and exposing yourself to negative things to actually build a, a deeper inner reservoir of joy and happiness. And it really, uh, some of these techniques, they're really simple, but they really work. So that's the yeah. essence of stoicism, is exposing yourself to things that can embarrass you and... That's, that's one part. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll give some other examples, is voluntary poverty. So mm. some of the stoics were uh, actually quite wealthy, like you know Seneca, who was an orator. But he would go off for uh, a week or a month and live in a very spare uh, environment in the countryside with, with minimal food, even some fasting there, uh, almost in poverty. And it greatly uh, enhanced his appreciation when he would come back, right? Mm -hmm. Or there was a technique called negative visualization, which sounds horrible because we're always taught to be think positive, right? But the idea is this is almost like a substitute for prayer when you, before you go to bed at night or when you get up or whatever time works, you think about all the things that you value, you know, your friendships, your, your stuff, your job, and you progressively go through and imagine losing all of those things. You know, you, your, your friends and your family, they, they die, you're destitute, and you kind of put yourself in that situation. Then you snap out of it and you realize, oh, None of that happened, you know, I've still got all of this. But it also applies to things like uh, having perspective. So it always amazes me how people in traffic, they will get so irate and they'll give you the finger, they'll, they'll flash something at you when they're cut off. It's like their ego is just harmed. And, and to me, the more you kind of practice stoicism, you realize all this stuff is just really inconsequential. And also if you have a bad day, it's really not a big deal. I used to get bummed when I would get a, tra a parking ticket. I'm like, oh, God, another parking ticket. And the way I think about it now is, look, 50 bad things are going to happen to me this year at least. So there's the traffic ticket. Check it off. Pay the fine. 
these things are going to happen to you. They're just part of it. And so good things and bad things are going to happen. And none of them are really that consequential. What's really consequential are your values, you know, the things you can control. These random events in life shouldn't really bother you. So I think a lot of stoicism is about kind of training yourself how to think about events in the world. And as a result, you're, you're, you're less attached and, and you're happier. It's almost kind of the Western analog to Zen Buddhism. I mean, a lot of the ideas go in the same that. Yeah. But I think the sto- Stoicism is a Western tradition. It's tied up with, you know, uh, uh, Greek and Roman philosophy with Aristotle, Plato, whatever. And so there's a whole line of thinking that, in, in a way, mirrors some of the Eastern thinking. The difference is, I think, Stoicism is more analytical about it. it, it it's very introspective. It thinks through okay, all these processes and how they work. And you can almost translate it to a biochemical level, right? You can start thinking about, okay, what is it about cold showers or exercise um, in terms of the hormones, right? So Westerners, we like to break things down like that. Some of the same ideas occur in Buddhism, but they're described in completely different language. But really, they're the same thing. That's very interesting. We're getting into, um, uh, this is hormesis in thinking. Yeah. How you can think more hormetically. And yeah. I find that very interesting because I've been doing, I've been practicing hormesis and thinking for a very long time. And I've also adopted various uh, Zen philosophies that, again, if you think of it in terms, you could think of it in terms of hormesis. So in America, we're very into like positive thinking. Right. And, like, you know, uh, before bed, you know, think about everything good in your life. And I'm just like, I'm just like thinking everything negatively. I'm like, hmm, what happens if everything just fails and right. my house burns down? <laughs> everything goes yeah. th- just every. And I find that you know, it, for a second, it could make you a little like, oh, that would be bad. But I'm much, much more resilient in my thinking like that, and exactly. I'm less attached. And uh, just when you think, you know, instead of I, I don't think of like I'm 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 not trying to put myself in some positive state. Instead, I'm trying to. You know, uh, think if ever, I lost everything, and um, and then and then you, and anything hap- anything that happens after that is not so bad. You got a parking ticket. <laughs> you're like, well, my house didn't burn down, and it's and you're not even telling yourself it. It's like if you really just put yourself in that, uh, if you have this hormesis type of thinking, um, you know, then that will have a very big impact. And yeah. also, um, you know, and and also some kind of. I guess it's a, a cognitive behavioral therapy of it, putting things into perspective. Like, it is. It, yeah. CBT is very is, is like a modern version of stoicism. It really is. Right. You're, you, yeah. Yeah. You get a ticket and you're just like, let me think about it. Does this really matter in the course of my life? Not yeah. really. Yeah. You know, it, it has really practical benefits, particularly in stressful situations. I'll give you an example. I was driving to the mountains with some friends to go skiing. And it was snowing and icy, and then the car got a flat tire. And I went out, yeah, what, you know, okay, that happened. I changed the tire. I'm under there with the change, put it on, got back in. And friend said, wow, how did you just do that? You know, what, didn't that freak you out? I'm like, it's going to happen, you know. And, and, and so, exactly. or, or you can be in a situation where you have to make a quick decision, whatever, and, and you just handle things calmly because you don't let events take over your whole nervous system, which really just paralyzes you. Um, but by being, it, by training yourself to be calm in these otherwise kind of stressful situations, you're able to think. And that's right. exactly when you need to think. You know? But I think it could be a little misleading saying training yourself. I think that you are doing that, but I think people have to realize that when you say training yourself, it's more of just exposing yourself, uh, not taking situations too seriously, mm. having a perspective. And, um, and and even just thinking of the worst case scenarios, um, obviously not dwelling on them all day, uh, but you know, mm-hmm. really uh, that hormesis type, you know, exposing yourself. I think that's that's how you train yourself. You become the, the training piece. The, the key in the training is the gradualism aspect. Yeah. Whether it's fasting, cold showers, dietary changes, exercise, exposure therapy. The, mistake, the, the twin mistakes people make are too little and too much. Right. You know, it's finding that, that optimum. And if even, you know, hormesis is actually, there's biological studies on it. There's a number of researchers like, like Rattan and Calabrese who study 
in plants and animals and bacteria, they expose them to levels of different toxins or UV or you know dietary stress. And they find in every case there's this U-shape or J-shape curve where there's an optimum level that stimulates the positive response, you know, the adaptive response. But if you go too high, you get a negative response. And so that's the art of hormesis is, is finding that zone for you and continually pushing it a little bit, but not too much. Interesting. Uh, by the way, I just thought of a random question that I probably should have asked before. Have you ever looked at sun and, um, and HRV? I haven't looked at sun. Because that I, would be a good one. That, that would be a good one. I am actually you know, a big believer in, in getting good sun exposure, and I, I, I discount a lot of the, the sort of fear about um, uh, melanoma and, and cancer there. I think the big issue with sun exposure, again, this has to do with gradualism, is people who are indoors all the time, right. then summer comes and they go out and lay out for the whole day and it's this sudden exposure and they get a sunburn, which is an inflammatory response. Whereas if you build up gradually and you're building up melanin and you're also making certain other changes in the skin, you're able to, uh, to benefit from that. Plus, there are some anti-cancer benefits that you get from the the type of vitamin D that's stimulated by sun exposure, which is a, a different form than what you take orally. It's a sulfated form? Exactly. Okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also um, it's, it's the um, calcitriol instead of the calcidiol. Oh, could yeah. you speak about that? So you're saying that sun increases calcitriol instead of... Uh... Well, ultimately, there's this whole process that goes through your, li your liver and everything. Okay, yeah. But I was thinking like... Um, Will you make more calcitri uh, calcitriol with sun or uh, vitamin D3? Um, just calcitriol. Like, is there any process by which the sun stimulates calcitriol more than uh, just the base, uh, the the vitamin D3 in your blood? Well, so okay, the vitamin D3 that you're measuring, the calcitriol, right? Yeah, it is is an intermediate. Exactly. Right. And there's some interesting feedback mechanisms there, where in in certain circumstances it as a precursor, it, it will lead to higher levels. It will it of lead to conversion oh, yeah. of, of calcitriol, but it can also interact with the vitamin D receptor, and, and it, it can even inhibit, you know, uh, at, at high levels. So it's a it's a tricky regulatory mechanism. So just supplementing with high levels of D three doesn't necessarily result in high levels of the biologically active form that you want, and also having having there's not necessarily a good correlation between the two. The kind that you measure when you, you know, get your blood drawn, um, the, the calcidiol, is not always reflective of the calcitriol, which, is, which you, can, you can request, but it's a little bit harder to measure. Yeah. So it's a, it's a tricky thing. Um, right, exactly. So um, that's why I was wondering if, um, if you're getting sun, if that increases calcitriol more than if you uh, were getting, if you were just taking D3. Do you, do you know of any research I, like that? I don't know specific research. I've, I've read that. Um, oh, you've read I, that, okay. Yeah, I've, I've read that that does, and also there's the difference between, as you said, the sulfated and non-sulfated forms too. And, uh -huh. and Seneff has written kind of about that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other benefits of the sun, like, for example, yeah. you're getting a load of infrared. And UV yes. is also... Um, so infrared is is amazing for your body in various ways, but UV is also suppressing your, you know, would suppress an overactive immune system in some ways. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of benefits, and maybe like photons uh, and and the spectrum of light. Um, you know, it's it's a powerful spectrum. So I think you're getting a whole bunch of benefits that you're not getting from D3. And yeah. I'm definitely on board that if you have too much of the inactive form it could compete with the vitamin D receptor. Right. Do you know what level that is, by the way, or it's dose-dependent? I don't know. You know, the, the people like to quote certain levels. I, I've got to believe, though, that that's, that, that level varies by, by individual, right? Um, if you think about it, the way I like to think about a, something like D3 or, uh, or cholesterol or any, any metabolite in your body is it's part of a network. Right, it's it's you're picking one marker, or, or even if you're looking at certain inflammatory markers, you're in certain cytokines, or you're looking at C-reactive protein, you're picking one marker out of the whole system and saying that this is the be-all and end-all. But that really can't be when you think about it. You've got this regulatory network 
Um, and if you raise the level of one component, the level of another one can come down. And depending on your particular health condition, what's right for you may or may not be right for another person. Exactly. The other thing is you can look at correlation versus causation. So it might be true that in general, people with certain health issues have low vitamin D levels or, you know, calcium diet levels. But is that a cause or a consequence? It's hard to tease those things out. So if it's a consequence, then adding more back into the system isn't going to necessarily correct the problem. Right. Um, and, and the truth is most of the studies don't come back as – it's a very complex problem. Most of the studies don't come back as being positive for vitamin D3 supplements, the, clinical, the good clinical trials. Yeah, and, when, you, um, when you add it back as a supplement, there's just not solid data Unless there. you're really deficient. Um, unless you're really deficient. Yeah. But beyond that, beyond like 30 nanograms per milliliter – Studies really don't show any significant benefits. It's more like because you need the active, the calcitriol, the active form in the body that really binds to the vitamin D receptor. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, yeah, yeah. The other thing is, is you know, people have to be careful about things. So there, there was this belief for a long time that you know we need calcium. We need to supplement with calcium because of osteoporosis and osteopenia. But if you just throw calcium into the system um, and, on, and and don't think about regulation. Uh, the, the body will put it where it's going to put it, and it might put it into uh, the lining, of the, you know, the epithelium of your arteries right. instead of into your bones. Exactly. Um, I, I find that uh, the best way to get good bone mineral density is exercise, right? right? And the the biggest health risk that a lot of older people are at is, is falls and low low um, uh, low bone mineral density. So the answer there is not to take calcium supplements, which might put the calcium in the wrong place. But to exercise, to weight-bearing exercise. And take vitamin K2, which I know you're going to disagree with. <laughs> well, that, that, that could help at some level. Right, if you're yeah. But... You know, in, in my personal experience is, is uh, my physician told me that when I was in the 20s, you know, my vitamin D3 in the 20s, uh, I should supplement, and I got it up to the 50s, and I noticed absolutely no benefit. You know, I was taking this, so I thought, if I don't know, and my health was good, I had no autoimmune, nothing like that, so I cut it out, it went back down to the mid-20s, I noticed no ill health effects from that. So what should I do about that? My bone mineral density, I had it tested. I'm in the 99th percentile. Oh, wow. So I got really strong bones. Wow. So, why should, so I got I, it. I hear you. It makes yeah, sense. Why should I take it? Well, I took a little bit of it. I don't, I don't think it'll, it's going to hurt you. You know, I, I, I don't get colds. I don't get infections. You know, all the things that people take it for. I so, hear that. I hear that from your perspective. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't I honestly I don't take it uh much because I get a lot of sun in especially in the summer, maybe a little in the winter, but uh in the summer I don't take it really. Mm -hmm. So the way I, the, I guess the way I look at health is if you eat whole foods and you don't eat constantly but you have sort of a natural pattern, if you get good sleep, if you expose yourself to natural stressors like the cold, exercise, um social stresses, physical stresses. These are the things that are going to activate the systems in your body. If, in terms of immune health, if particularly as a child you're exposed to animals and farms and nature, you're going to activate, uh, you know, T cell response, um, and you're going to have uh, less tendency to pick up autoimmune disorders. So, the answer in so many different areas is exposure. If you use your eyes by instead of sitting and reading on the computer all day. You mix it up and you spend time outdoors and you look at, at all different distances. Um, your eyes are going to go through their full range of motion. So rather than putting on glasses and continuing to sit up close. So sort of in all of these areas, um, use the, the natural endogenous capability that our bodies have to uh, improve health rather than trying to find some missing ingredient that you don't have at this or that level and, and titrate it back up. Uh huh. No, I, I agree with that. By the way, have you ever checked your cal like um, how much calcium you're getting from food? I'm curious if, if you're getting like a, the recommended RDA or do you even not care about if you're getting the RDA? You know, I, I eat a, uh, a diet that's full of natural meats, uh, green ve leafy vegetables that have a lot of calcium in them. A certain amount of dairy, not an excessive amount. Right. A little bit of dairy, 
um, fish that has plenty of calcium in it, and it's all in a form that's very absorbable. Right. Um, the other thing is, I don't think I have any issues, any absorption issues. I guess people who might have problems with absorption might need to take special supplements. But you know, part of it is if you're in good health and you're able to absorb, what, then, then your body will naturally select what it needs from the diet. And you probably don't need a huge amount of calcium to you know to stay at that level. The problem is is when you lo lose it, right? When you're dysregulated and you're losing bone mass. Right. What about now? We're coming to the end, but I'm just curious about your opinions on libido and hormesis and sleep and hormesis. How could we implement hormesis to improve those aspects of our lives? Okay. Well, let's see. I'll start with sleep. Okay. Uh, I think getting really good, regular, physical exercise is, one of, to me, the, key, the keys to good sleep. You know, when you're physically tired, you sleep much better than when you're mentally tired. Right. So I, I think that's, that's a key. Um, I think overeating can, can cause sleep problems. But, you know, I do know in some cases people who may have low insulin or maybe a bit hypoglycemic, May may tend to have high levels of uh, uh, norepinephrine or, or certain stress hormones. You know, maybe they need to be careful to eat right. to eat regularly. Um, well, again, it depends. Like in my case, not really anymore. It was now I'm just good. I could I'm I could be good with two meals a day, but at a certain point, I needed um, for a lot of my readers just struggling with health issues. Uh, I didn't want them to get the wrong idea. That you know, hormesis is great, but you have to apply it to your level. And, yeah, and you're you're definitely on board with that. Definitely, and 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 um, everybody's going to be a little bit different, so you've got to you've got to adjust. Um, and what about so? What about uh, libido? Libido. Um, so I think that I think there is a little bit of an argument for moderation um, in sort of <laughs> level of sexual activity. I think. If you allow some period of time between, you know, sexual events, you tend to build up more of a libido. Mm. But it's probably to some extent dependent on how old you are, your overall level of health. There is one interesting uh, set of uh, um, comments that I get, and this is from men who are dealing with pornography addiction issues, mm -hmm. and and who have been. Ex you know, like exposing themselves to pornography, from, particularly from a really young age, it, and, and much more graphic, you know, these days with the internet and whatever, and they're always going after more and more stronger stimuli, and then uh, what they find is that they have real trouble with um, in, in real sexual encounters, right? <laughs> uh, because the reality is not as stimulating as what they've seen on the internet or whatever. So there's actually a, a couple good people who are blogging on this. Um, uh, there's a, a site, there, there's this site called Reuniting, and there's a whole theory of rebooting. And the idea is actually to, to abstain mm -hmm. for a period of time um, and just cut out pornography or internet exposure. And what the typical response is actually a period of almost depression and a real difficulty and loss of interest, but depending on the age of the person and how long they go, there's this really interesting thing, you've, and, and there's people who posted on my site about this, that they find that after a month or two, their libido comes back, and comes back very strong. It's a really interesting effect. Mm, right. And um, they're becoming more tuned towards sort of natural sexual stimuli with real people or in real situations. So, um, some people take this as kind of an anti-pornography you know, concept, and that's not really what it's about, because maybe some people can handle that. But for people who are real, really addicted and whose libido has been shot by it, this kind of period of abstinence, or what they call rebooting, um, has been shown to be uh, pretty effective. I think you could say that's a, a hormetic response. One way I think about this, and also about depression and about obesity, has to do with receptors. So we have uh, receptors in the brain for um, dopamine, right, which uh, responds to uh, novel stimuli and to pleasure. And if we're constantly uh, uh, 
in indulging in really tasty food, lots of sex, you know, drugs, whatever, and particularly in drug addictions, you're uh, maxing out the stimulation of those dopamine receptors, and you often get a down regulation exactly. in response. And that can actually be fairly significant. So then this gets back to that whole opponent process theory of emotion, you know, with addiction and with different stimuli. If, if you have overstimulus and then the down regulation, you're going to be somewhat desensitized. And when, you, when, the, when the stimulus isn't there, you're going to be somewhat anhedonic and feeling like you're lacking pleasure. So it takes time to grow back the dopamine receptors and to upregulate them. And, and the other thing I found, and this has worked for some of these people with the libido or addiction problems, pornography addiction, cold showers, intense exercise, and particularly uncomfortable, challenging exercise like sprints, lifting heavy weights. So, so cutting, cutting or dampening down the frequency of pleasure exposure, exposing yourself to these sort of intense, uncomfortable experiences, and you're, you essentially now upregulate dopamine receptors. And this isn't just theory. This has actually been shown in, in animal studies with addicted individuals, with obese individuals that you can see um, through uh, brain imaging, you know, activation of, of the different um, dopamine and serotonin receptors in the brain. Um, and you can see responses to fasting and things like that. So it's pretty interesting to actually boil it down to the level of, of receptors. That's, that's, this is all very fascinating, and uh, I definitely appreciate um, all the tips that you gave us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're obviously a very smart guy, and um, yeah, I like your approach. Hormesis, we definitely should be focusing more on hormesis instead of just uh, trying to pop a pill, even though I pop many pills. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, I, so I definitely appreciate uh, the time that you gave us today, and um I'm going to be looking at your blog. Is there anywhere, um, can you, you know, where can people find you? Do you have any products uh, you want to promote or anything like that? <laughs> you know, I don't have any products. My blog, Getting Stronger, is gettingstronger.org. Uh, it's, there's, I don't sell anything on there. It's okay. just a, 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 a labor of love. And uh, I have a, also a forum, a discussion forum, where people get actively involved in debating some of these things. A lot of stuff on on vision, nice, active there, and then I periodically, uh, you know, talk at, at conferences like Ancestral Health Symposium. Um, so I think the blog is a good place to start. But Joe, thank you very much for the the interview and the chance to chat today. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm gonna keep uh, you know keep track of your blog and um, yeah, have a great day. All right, you too. Thank you very much. Yeah, take care.